bought this platform. Oh yeah, I forgot to say we are recording. I hope that's okay for everyone. Um, we, we collect all this dialogue across uh, um, the different platforms and different projects and different kind of meetings. And on a website, which you can see at the forestschool.net, I will put it into the chat in a minute. Um, you can also um, sign up to a newsletter on that website at the bottom left um, if you want to keep informed uh, about the series and the many activities that's going on. Maybe quickly before I hand over, um, it's uh, just talking you through the kind of order of play for today. We have, as part of this, we have commissioned um, graduates to contribute. So it's a kind of an open platform, not only for a lecture, but also for other forms of production that happen in the college to be showcased. We have invited uh, Aberrescent News as a recent graduate from the MH to um, prepare a news broadcast for every session. So you will uh, enjoy that in a minute. It's a short four minute film. After this, I will hand you over to Catalina Media Moreno, who is our co-curator for the se season, but also um, um, the senior lecturer in climate studies at Spatial Practices. She will host the session today and the Q&A, but it's also the link to Colombia for us. And it's, it's very generous of Catalina to open her network and bring that into that space. So thank you very much. Our guests today, each giving a 10 minute presentation is Anna, Juliana, and Pedro, and we will uh, have a more kind of careful introduction to them in a minute. But for me, thank you very much for joining us. It's really nice to have you. And it's wonderful that you got up early and uh, kind of interrupted your morning routine to be with us. Um, I know some of the speakers have to leave sharp at, after one hour. So we'll um, say goodbye in case we are going longer. And to see us out, we have Kamal and Bray uh, listening to the forest uh, a radio segment which we'll, we will play at the end so if you're in an office and you want to keep listening but there are also all the content will be uploaded onto our website afterwards and also just a quick thank you and a con contextualization the forest school for us is is not only for us to kind of generate knowledge in that space but also to create partnerships and we're really pleased to have white architecture as a partner and supporter on board and I know a lot of um, um, white employees are in the space specifically the Malmö office uh, it's really nice to have you and it's also really nice to hear your voices and some responses to the lectures are also on the website so if you read Swedish you can see uh, some really nice responses there and uh, of course uh, another important partner for us is Forestry England who will be uh, joining the discussion more and more as the series continues. And there are other projects we're just starting with Forestry England again, which are on the website. So thank you all for being here. And um, I hand over, uh, but before I do so, just a reminder, it's, it is a lecture, but it's maybe also not a lecture. It is a school. So feel free to uh, ask questions, interject, um, wherever you are, um, in whichever way, it's really appreciated so that this becomes a space of dialogue and that we all contribute to this, uh, constructing that dialogue together. We try to give enough space for conversations. If we run beyond one hour, after one hour, I will make a hard break, but I will leave the chat open so we can continue. Those of you who can continue who have time. Thank you very much. And if there are questions, jump them, dump them in the chat. Um, and um, or uh, unmute. And of course, it's always really nice to see faces. So if you're comfortable to take your, put your camera on, um, it's really nice to see you. Thank you. So I invite uh, you to see our news broadcast before we hand over. Gemma, could you play this? We can't hear. Is, is the audio playing? No. 
maybe while we fix this, just remember we are in a digital I space. Find it really... so, yeah. Ah, hello, don't mind me. Just doing a bit of forest bathing. I find it really helps with the mental health and well-being. Um, in today's Forest Talk series, Indigenous Knowledges, we shall explore the forest as a space of intimacy, emphasising how the well-being of forests are intimately linked to the well-being of the people who inhabit them. It is to move away from Western ideals of living with and for forests and to inspire and cultivate arts of living with our boreal kin, but also one another. Joining us today in the space of sharing and reflection, we will hear from Anna Maria sharing her experience of working with the Paori Indigenous community towards the conception and construction of a hotel of the La Urbana community in Matavan Jungle. Juliana will share the ongoing process of the Indigenous University that has been created by the Inga Indigenous community. And finally, Pedro will speak about his intervention, Ant's Mangrove Ocean, which reflects on a series of moments shared with a friend, Smith Valencia. They come together to reveal ways of co-creating, co-living and co-designing for the flourishing of multi-species futures. Don't mind me, I'm going to go back to forest bathing now. Hello friends and kin of Mother Earth. Before I pass over to Catalina to introduce our sharers in more detail, and before we hear Cameron's botanical radio transmission, we shall close today's talk. I will end this short broadcast by sharing an excerpt of a love letter to Mother Earth by Thich Nhat Hanh upon his return to the planet. Walking tenderly on Mother Earth. Dear Mother Earth, every time I step upon the earth, I will train myself to see that I am walking on you, my mother. Every time I place my feet on the earth, I have a chance to be in touch with you and with all your wonders. With every step, I can touch the fact that you aren't just beneath me, dear mother, but you are also within me. Each mindful and gentle step can nourish me, heal me, and bring me into contact with myself and with you in the present moment. Walking in mindfulness, I can express my love, respect, and care for you, our precious earth. I will touch the truth that mind and body are not two separate entities. I will train myself to look deeply to see your true nature. You are my loving mother, a living being, a great being, an immense, beautiful and precious wonder. You are not only matter, you are also mind, you are also consciousness. Just as the beautiful pine or tender grain of corn possesses an innate sense of knowing, so too do you. Our nature is your nature, which is also the nature of the cosmos. Therefore, I make the promise today to return your love and fulfill this wish of investing every step I take on you with love and tenderness. I am walking not merely on matter, but on spirit. This paper was brought to you by White Architects and Forestry England. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Emma. Gemma, for, for streaming. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> Your adverse and news are always such a pleasure um, and the best way to start these conversations. So to introduce myself, I am Catalina Mejia Moreno. Uh, I am Senior Lecturer in Climate Studies at the Spatial Practices Program in Central San Martins. Um, so good afternoon to you all, buenos dias, Colombia. 
It's really a pleasure for me to be hosting this second Forest School Talks. So today we'll be taking you all to Colombia, the most beautiful country in South America. My home and the home of my friends, colleagues and allies, Pedro, Juliana and Ana Maria, uh, who we have the pleasure and the honor to be sharing this conversation with today. So before I start, before they start, I'd like to give you a bit of context. Um, so Colombia is known also as the home of forests. More than 59 million of hectares are forests, which is equivalent to 54% of our whole territory. And to give you an idea, covering an area larger than the total area of Spain. Home of forests also means that our territory is home to different forests. Bosque Andino, or the Andean forest, which includes humid forests and fog forests. Bosque Secos, dry forests. Bosque de Galeria, gallery forests. Characteristics of the floatable areas near two of our main rivers, El Rio Trato and Magdalena, but also the, of the Orinoquia region near to the Amazon. And lastly, Bosque Humeo Tropical, humid tropical forests and manglares, mangroves, characteristic of the Amazon and the Pacific and Caribbean regions. As the invitation to this conversation highlights, in Colombia, the forest is a space and a place of intimacy, emphasizing how the well-being of forests is intimately linked to the well-being of people who inhabit them. Ana, Juliana and Pedro will take us to the Pacific, to the Amazon and to the Putumayo forests forests that are mainly inhabited by indigenous communities and Afro-diasporic communities. These forests are some of the richest ecosystem and eco-diverse areas in the world, but at the same time, some of the most affected regions by the ongoing violence in our country that has inhabited these territories for decades. I therefore like to conclude this brief introduction by acknowledging all those who live in the present danger to their life, to their livelihoods and their loved ones surviving and resisting the exploitation, subordination and marginalization, exacting that system of racialized practices, structures and knowledges that we know as colonialism. Characterized by practices of intimacy, listening, collaboration and mutual respect, Ana Juliana and Pedro's work acknowledges them in solidarity, in their ancestral and embodied knowledges, recognizing their struggles, livelihoods and multiplicity of words, words offering as they do not just resistance just not resistance but histories and practices of life working with one another as grounded being, beings in and of this only earth so we will start listening by pedro uh, from pedro aparicio llorente who currently thinks feels and tries to do architecture through multi-species technologies this stems from an interest in the relationship that people make when inhabiting beyond human time cycles. He enjoys working in places where correspondence, correspondence is intimately forged from the landscape. He's based in Bogota, Colombia, where he leads APLO, an office where they, where they design buildings, events, and objects. We will then listen from Juliana Ramirez, who is a Colombian architect that specializes in social design strategies, pedagogical solutions, and collaborative building processes with vulnerable people groups. Her work engages rural communities that have been deeply affected by poverty and violence in Colombia. In 2019, she led the Toilet Garden Project in Ghana, awarded by the Colombian Council of Architecture Professionals. Through teaching, Juliana encourages critique on architecture in natural environments by creating room for dialogue and co-creation with students and indigenous communities alike. And we will close with Ana, Ana Maria Gutierrez, the co-founder and director of the Colombian-based practice Organismo, which focuses on the creation, study, and promotion of sustainable habitats. Some of the areas of expertise include permaculture, bioarchitecture, and intu intuitive technologies. Organismo also hosts educational exchanges intended to strengthen cultural identities and ancestral techniques in several regions of Colombia, and in direct collaboration with local indigenous communities. So it's a pleasure and an honor to have you all here. Muchas gracias. Pedro, on to you. Thank you, um, Catalina, and everyone that's connected. Um, Okay. 
So I'll begin, uh, yeah, recognizing and acknowledging the um, community of, of Coqui in the Pacific Ocean, a group of friends, uh, fishermen, farmers, people that have taught me a lot of things and uh, that the presentation today will orbit around ideas that have emerged from that place. Um, this talk, I'm gonna briefly introduce this idea of the Escuela Manglar or the Mangrove School, which is a um, academic pedagogic project with friend Smith Valencia, who's a fisherman, farmer, chef from Coqui, and uh, that it aligns with ideas on reading and writing the landscape um, as forms of multi-species technologies. Um, we are sited in the Pacific coast of Colombia, as you can see in this drawing. Um, it's a place that has been kind of um, thought of as an isolated place or a place without opportunity, but it's actually a place where once a year for 8,000 kilometers, uh, humpback whales migrate. Um, and find this place as a very safe place to, to have their babies and teach them to swim. So it, um, it's a place that kind of provides a, a different narrative, right? Uh, um, around the multiple migrations that happen there uh, every year. It's a gulf, one of the deepest gulfs in the world. Um, forest, tropical forest, a lot of rivers come down. And in each of the estuaries or deltas of those rivers, there's small settlements um, where black and indigenous communities uh, have been inhabiting this place for some time. Um, and there's a very beautiful relationship with the cycles of the tides. This is a very special intertidal zone where there is the eight cycle um, waters coming in and out, one of the most robust populations of mangrove. Um, and we will be kind of centering in this small island town of Coqui, where by different reasons I've ended up there. And specifically this gulf um, in this drawing that it lays in the airport of Nuki um, provides kind of this, this encounter, right? Where the idea of precision and scale is diluted um, to the coexistence of, of multiple species, right? So maybe a person is larger than an airplane and a frog is the same size as, as a whale. I'll be um, focusing on, on this idea of the mangrove at school as a thought. Um, perhaps um, schools have, uh, try to divide body and mind. And at the end, body and mind is all the same. So perhaps knowledge is not about carrying a book underneath the arm, but rather not carrying anything at all, just carrying that knowledge in the body. Um, so this is a, a little bit about being in the mangrove, being within the tides and tuning in to the thought of the mangrove or the thinking of the mangrove. And uh, Currently, we're designing this uh, pedagogic program that begins um, with the construction of, of a payao that basically acknowledges the um, a mangrove tree that has kind of ended its cycle in the forest, uh, opened a new clearing, provided new light for the forest. And uh, once that mangrove has fallen, um, it is identified, uh, here's my friend Smith leading the group. Um, and that uh, tree is wrapped, is tied with a, a sequence of uh, floating uh, balsos, another tree that floats. Um, this then provides us a space of buoyancy in the morning where the tree kind of gently rests in, in the water. And uh, after, a uh, whole morning of working on that. Uh, when the tides are changing, um, it becomes it becomes a moment to perhaps take out the the tree.
to take out a mangrove tree uh, from the river all the way to the ocean, almost three or 350 meters into the ocean. It suddenly, it's a moment of effort and pulling, but then suddenly it's just a space of like floating and being uh, in this kind of boat garden. The sound of, of the motors uh, suddenly ceases, and uh, there's almost like a space of meditation between the waves um, and the trees. Almost 12 hours later, the, the tree sinks in a matter of seconds. So through being in those learning spaces of ours where bodies actually carried knowledge around um, along with colleagues, Angela and Daniel, we've been redrawing uh, these actions and uh, providing a sense of, of scale and recognition of what it means to read and write uh, in the landscape. At the end, the construction of this architecture is uh, a tree that stays half between the bottom of the ocean and the surface, um, marked with a buoy that allows for new fish to arrive, smaller fish to find a, a space of refuge, and uh, eventually it becomes a place for fishing. It's, it's a, a temporal marine garden. So we, we built this before the migration of the sardines so that the garden would be seeded with uh, fish. Also part of these uh, pedagogies in the river and the, and the tides and the mangrove and the ocean are around the collection of hojarasca or all of the leaves that are brought by, um, by the river. And the recollection eventually combines with um, the building of a precise substrate that is a mixture of leaves and ant uh, soil. The leaf cutting ant of this part of, of Colombia actually takes out all, all of its waste uh, to, to, the, to the ground. And this is mixed to make this very beautiful uh, technology that is um, the azoteas that provides fresh herbs that are medicinal, that are used by midwives, but are also used in cooking for um, so to so provide a very precise um, yeah, condition in, in the cycle of, of eating and, and living. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, we have 10 minutes already, sorry <laughs> to interrupt. So with, with this idea, I wrap it's that encounter between uh, the leaves, the trees, the tides, um, and the ants. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I don't like doing that that much. Um, that was very beautiful. Um, Anna, Juli, it's okay if Anna continues, just I'm thinking of time. Um, so Anna, if you would like to continue, Anna has to leave us uh, at, at half past sharp. So maybe if you want to jump in. She looks frozen. 
Yeah, I cannot see her. Uh, she's frozen, maybe we should care for the Anna, can you hear us? Let's, okay, Juli, maybe shall we continue with you then? While Anna joins us back. Yeah, sure. Thank Let you. me share my screen. Is my screen showing? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Good. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to be sharing this space uh, with all of you and connecting through the subject of the forest. First of all, I want to thank life and the universe for being in this space. And I want to, to with much respect, to remember and mention the taitas, mamas, sabedores, and all human and non-human beings uh, that inhabit these territories to which I have been invited in the recent years. In this space of dialogue that opens, I want to honor Ta Taita Paulino Mohomboy um, the, of the Inga community of Putumayo, this elder who left life this last week um, to honor him, I want to open this talk with a video documentary produced by the communications collective uh, Nyambi Rimai uh, from the Inga community in 2019. Uh, and I think this will take us into the spirit of the forest and into the sacred plant of Ambiwaska. Let me know if the sound is working. Good. Pero no que yo ya no porque un chido saquido, no que está ahí tan no que es mamá está saquido, ande, no canche gente con amanda, no canche pa, pues maican monasca, pero pues ni con hechaza, pero respetaza guardarifa. Un taita nace, eso viene de, desde el nacimiento, pues es un don que mi Dios le da al, a la persona, porque todos no podemos ser taita. Mi papá, pues, es reconocido, bien apreciado así, porque él ha hecho muchas sanaciones, muchas curaciones a, muchas, a muchos pacientes en las diferentes partes y se han curado. Yo soy como un, un seguidor y médico tradicional. Para ser taita, pues ya tiene que darle la orden y pues, el taita mayor. Ay, vaya, a mí so Ah, 
territorio, como decimos los indígenas, pues no hay vida. Tomando yagé se puede eh, cuidar el territorio, porque ahí está la espiritualidad, ahí está pues la sabiduría. El yagé es la universidad. Well, uh, with, with this video of Taita Paulino and his son, Herman, uh, uh, this opens like many multiple channels of information. Um, they belong to the Inga indigenous community and live in the Amazonian foothills of Putumayo. The ancestral Inga territory is situated at the intersection of the Andes and the Amazon basin. The forests of these interconnected regions show unique ecological and cultural characteristics of both the Andes and the Amazon. The Piedemonte Amazoni and Dino Amazonico is considered one of the greatest sources of biophysical uh, richness in the hemisphere with an enormous climatic and variability of ecosystems. This great uh, biological variability and resilience of the Amazon a region depends on its ecosystems and reciprocal cycles of aerial and subterranean interaction between the Andes and the Amazonian geographies. This picture shows uh, the location where the university is going to be located, uh, right in the Piedemonte Amazonico. Mm, and against the violence of against the violence uh, of the ways of life and territories. The Inga indigenous people of Colombia are leading a path of knowledge to conceptualize, design, and build an indigenous university for the generation of biocultural and pluriepistemic knowledge. This university project is based on the principles of indigenous territory autonomy and cosmology as part of the strategy to guarantee the physical and cultural perm permanence of the Inga people. Mm, this initiative is led by the Inga territorial entity called Awai and uh, its allies. And uh, this has been a collaborative research project for the creation of the indigenous higher education institution that fosters the pluriepistemic and ecocentric appro approach. And this is mainly uh, aims to, to get to strengthen territorial governance which is strongly allied to the protection of these spaces and this biodiversity to bridge indigenous and Western knowledge systems with the same recognition given to academic and indigenous researchers and to defend a paradigm shift in nature uh, and human relations to protect life and biocultural uh, diversity. Um, this process have been coming along through the Mingas of Pensamiento. Uh, this indigenous university is a collective project emerging from uh, many conversations among the Inga community with other actors of the region, with architects and a range of scientific and academic partners from Western education systems. Many universities are involved and in supporting the project uh, too. The purpose of these meetings is to conceptualize and uh, the future institution and higher education and to support any uh, activities that uh, this conceiving this project might, might take. 
And we call these meetings Domingas of Pensamiento or the work of collective thinking. And throughout these Mingas, we have come to the clear vision that the plant, the yaje, uh, the ambiwasca, or better known as ayahuasca, is and will be the essence and source of knowledge in the learning process of the university. Um, I mean, these uh, taitas and through the plant are going to be in the center of the of the, all the conceptualization of the of the university. Um, understanding these uh, Andean Amazonian territory, the Yaje territory also, lets us to this vision of understanding the university, the indigenous university as something very different as a centralized campus um, and understanding it rather than a university campus built uh, on, uh, in the side of a territory. The territory itself becomes the university and uh, it turns into a place to learn and to partner with any teaching and learning processes. So that takes us to understand uh, the, the territorial um, powerful uh, way of understanding the campus of the university. So we are started to, to think uh, of it as a five scale intervention. First, the, the first scale would be understanding it as a region, as a interweaving an Amazonian territory as a university. Uh, the second scale would be in the municipality scale, uh, understanding the university as a catalyst of local processes and understanding it as a, for example, as a first project of a biocultural corridor that impacts uh, the region of Piamonte Cauca. The third scale would be the, um, uh, the site, the precise site where the buildings are going to be built, um, but in a very close relationship with the forest. And uh, the, the, the fourth scale would be building uh, very close to the community and understanding the, the local techniques and um, the, the original techniques of the area. And the last scale would be like in the detail of weaving and uh, the, getting into the materiality of, uh, of all the fibers and crafts of uh, the, the, art, the local artisans. So that's the idea of the Indigenous University. Gracias, Juli. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation. I'm sure there will be lots of questions coming uh, after that. Anna, are you okay to present now? I'm ready. Let's hope so, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is too short to be such a great gathering. Thank you. It's, it's, Awesome to have colleagues that are more than friends and family and, and, and share and be able to listen to their work. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Kata, you're, you're the leader of all this. So thank you very much. Are you seeing my screen? Yeah? Yes. Okay. So very quick, I would like to um, tell you a little bit the empirical path that led uh, me, uh, my personal quest, and of course the, the guidelines of the NGO that I founded to arrive to the forest as our classroom and as our inspiration. And the first, uh, what took us, what, what started, like every, every path comes out of a frustration. So our first uh, search was uh, in our learning and teaching experiences, how do we unite the hands with the head, the, the tactile experiences we're missing in the architecture um, school I, I, I attended. So we entered to, to, to interact with the soils. Um, oops, sorry, one second. Uh, uh, Earth and architecture was, was the first thing that made us arrive to understand the importance of the tactile uh, approach to any manifestation of architecture. Uh, but the earth took us to different other techniques and uh, it took us uh, to understand the importance of the, of, of, of the, of the practice. 
practice, the praxis in, in how we are uh, understanding all these um, earthen techniques, we arrive to uh, rural areas in this country. And, uh, and some of mainly the rural areas where, that we arrived uh, to work with um, was at the beginning was the Amazon. And this was our, our classroom. This, was, this opened our, and made us redefine architecture. Um, it's not an. It's not about an infrastructure. It's not about an ego designing for others. It's about how to inhabit a territory and how to read the territory. So the Amazon was our classroom, and I'm going to go very quickly to to arrive to the project that I want to show you. The Amazon and different areas, rural areas of of different indigenous communities, and their techniques was our main understanding that architecture, uh, like I said, has to be a combination. I want to simplify it for, for these 10 minutes. as a combination of the expression of these five areas, the crafts, the vernacular architecture, the, the traditional uh, um, cooking, the, the, say, the food safety, the agroecology, and the cosmovision of the community. So for us, architecture has to involve these five I mean, it is present. We have to be able to see these expressions uh, to therefore start talking about um, uh, a habitat, uh, architecture for community. So, and this was the teachings of the Amazons at the beginning. And, and, and we started redefining our curriculums that we teach in the, in the center. And we started def defining the, the community approaches. So um, this has been our teachers. We understood that it has to be through the practice. It has to be through the experience one-to-one -one of, of these human interactions and the interactions with the materials that we're going to be actually um, understanding the processes. Because when we talk about a forest or an ecosystem, we're talking about cycles and we're talking about uh, uh, materia prima, the prime matter of everything. And uh, our teachers are the local ones. And therefore we understand that we as architects, we are the ones that, uh, visualizes or put on the table the abundance of the territory. Nothing more. We don't teach. Uh, we just understand what, what is there uh, for years. What is this ancestral knowledge that is present for years? How is it being expressed in walls, in roofs, in, uh, in gatherings, in food? Uh, and, and therefore, that, that, that's what we try to put to the table and then have a big fest of abundance uh, for whatever the project is. So uh, the, the first five years in the Amazon taught us this way of, of understanding the territories, of the way of entering the territories. For us, this, this idea of decolonizing uh, methods, is, 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 it's, it's the main first step and the most important one, because this, if, if we don't have a clear horizontal uh, communication with, with whoever we're meeting in life, and we keep thinking that, that or, 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 or arriving, with assumptions to a place, uh, we're, we're never going to be able to really design or, or new paradigmas or, or understand uh, anything of anywhere. Um, so after having this master's for good years, I, uh, we're now in a very beautiful project in La Selva de Mataven. La Selva de Mataven is el department, el departamento de Vichada. Um, el departamento de Vichada is a, is a jungle, what we call a jungle of transition between the Amazons and the Orinoquia. Uh, it's beautiful because it involves mountains that uh, used to belong to Pangea. It, uh, it involves uh, uh, flooding areas, it involves savannas, and, in, and involves jungles of transition. So it's a very particular ecosystem. And they have, it has like five different uh, indigenous communities, Sicuanis, Piapocos, uh, Curipacos, Puinaves, and Piaroa. We're gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be showing you the Piaroa pr uh, process here and what I was invited to, to share with, with them and to learn from them. So this community um, uh, won a competition for, for, to design a new tourism and they wanted to design a hotel. And they, they called me to, uh, to accompany them in the process of designing this hotel. So this, this has been a wonderful, wonderful process. And if it wasn't because of the, the um, understandings and the school of the for we couldn't have arrived to these dialogues with them. They're, they're craft people, they're weavers. 
son, son artesanos, it's, which is like a, a beautiful scenario to arrive to, no? because they have a connection. like all indigenous communities with their territory, with their uh, materials, with the processes of the jungle. Uh, so it's a beautiful school to arrive to. Um, and uh, it was beautiful because when we started uh, telling them, okay, how do you want to open your house to, to create a hotel? No, you're opening your house. You're gonna invite people. You're gonna invite other cultures to, to, to your home. Uh, they immediately uh, started telling us, uh, before that we have to talk explain you how is our cosmovision. Our cosmovision, I, I assume we all understand what, what this word talks about, but it's mainly the understanding of the, uh, the sacredness of the territory and how do they uh, think, how they, do they inhabit their thinking. So our first lesson was, uh, was beautiful, was uh, with, the, with the wise men of this community and they started telling us about their ceremonial houses, which are called the churuatas or pureidos, and, uh, and the understanding, the, the, the direct dialogue between the understanding of the circular way of thinking and this architecture. Yeah. So um, uh, when, uh, when we had this first uh, beautiful uh, introduction to their cosmovision, to their way of understanding the, their thought, their circularity, uh, we started understanding this structure that they already had uh, started building and how the circular uh, way of thinking of their ancestrals and the and how they see the intercul intercular inter inter interculturalidad rectangular rectangular interculturality was meeting in this first architecture that that, that they were expressing um, the first uh, months of work with them were, were understanding these shapes and forms and their meetings and how can they uh, create an architecture that is going to uh, talk alone, that they don't have to introduce their culture. That is like this big uh, house that is gonna talk about their knowledge, their craftsmanship. Um, and uh, we all started uh, uh, with this introduction of, of, of of, of their main interest, designing together uh, the space. Uh, this is a process of, 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 of co-creation. This is the only, pro the only way for us to understand, to create appropriation of the, of the places that you build. When you design it from the beginning, when the community uh, um, creates its own space, is the only way that they're gonna inhabit it and, 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 and believe it their own. Otherwise, it will be just another intervention coming from, from abroad. Uh, so this was the first, I don't know, maybe three months of the process. We were understanding their weaving techniques. We were understanding uh, how they used to build before. Why are they building this way? Um, we, uh, we were entering in this dialogue of, of just understanding all the abundance that they had as, as weavers, which is their main craft. Um, we started uh, combining uh, their, their craftsmanship with their understanding of the, of the cosmovision of the territory. And then what we as architects do, we translate it into a design, which is the less important part of this process. Uh, we had to uh, concrete the spaces and understand how the hotel was it, but this is something that, is, that anyone can do, you know, and, and then manifested it so they could visualize what they were already expressing you know the is this is actually the first project that we've had renders and, and stuff like this this came back to the territory uh, this this is the result of, of 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 the design that we all did together the understanding of the type of tourism that they wanted to create and the understanding of this circular space that you can see in the middle which is this big universe that they wanted to to receive the the the, the tourists in um so we did these all these um, images to show them to see if we were talking in the same language, you know, to see if we are. Is this what you imagine? Is this what we are talking about? Is this? Uh, and and then we brought them these images back to the community uh, to understand. Okay, so so are you sure you wanna a weave a basket that is three stories high because it's so important for them to 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 receive the community in the basket of knowledge woven by the women 
and they were all super super sure about this uh, intention that I have that I've put in the design and how they were looking for uh, the beginning. When we had the design ready, we started exploring the materials. They used to build in Waddle and Dock, which is an earth. We're happy reminding it. All the older women came, reminded the how they used to have their houses. So this was a technique that was not present at the moment, but that we we brought it back from the, from the memories. They do it in a very in a different way that I was doing it in other areas in the country. Uh, but it was a really uh, important process to, to revive in the community. And then we started understanding, uh, not all of them speak Spanish, so we, our hands are our translation, uh, are the way that we translate each other. We started prototyping these walls to understand the reality of it. Are we gonna, how are we gonna do it? And, and, uh, and they started bringing three, four different types of, of woods that they have in the jungle that they could bend or they, or they could weave in. And this was like the second part of the process, like the next half of the year, proto prototyping and understanding if what they drew and what we represented, how was it gonna be built? Uh, and the times, no? When, when do you cut that wood? How long it takes to dry? Uh, how do you peel it? You know, all the, this whole part, the, the, the whole pr part of the cycles and the processes are, are uh, becomes the new world we have to swim in and dance and, and, and be completely immersed in to really understand uh, if it's feasible or not feasible. And then, okay, we already had the design, we were already proto prototyping the walls. So it was time to, to jump into action and, and make it happen. Um, the the uh, the strength of these processes is that they've been involved since the first line because it was through their explanation of everything that when the action comes and we start uh, we start building you don't have to do more than 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 receive all this powerful energy because they all want to see what's happening you know because they all were part of 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 the process. This included also the, the landscaping design with the native plants, understanding the spaces that they could uh, design as visual barriers or uh, gardens or, or native agroforestal trekkings around the, host, uh, around the hotel. All of this was designed by them and then planted by them. And we started, we continued prototyping and we started propagating plants that, we, that they all knew they could, it could be beautiful to have. And, uh, and then it was time to make it happen. And on these processes, you never know what the outcome is gonna be. And you have to be all the time uh, solving things in the, in the job site, which is the reality of, of uh, an architecture in the middle of the jungle. And which is the power of it because, because we all have to be completely aligned and completely understanding. But the prototyping of it was completely crucial. Um, this was the, the last visit. Uh, the last day of the last visit, they were extremely happy because they were so stubborn about this huge basket that, that uh, illustrated the universe for them and that was going to receive the lobby of the hotel that, uh, the, that a week later, I'm gonna show you the photos that they're sending me. Uh, so in the inside of, the, of this huge basket, the women are weaving in the outside uh, of the basket, which is this other chonta wood, the men are weaving. And this was a, a, something that was a statement between them. The other, the other walls are um, a wattle and dop that they uh, wanted to bring into. And then another weaving, this is the wattle and dop, uh, also done by the men and directed by the men. And these were positions that were just uh, happening very naturally. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, the process of, of every wood was being done to advance by these big mingas, which is a word that uh, Juli used as well, which is ba ba basically our way of, it's, it's how all the communities have built their houses. You know, they all go and build the house of someone and then the house of someone and that's, you know, the real community uh, potential. And uh, in this process, it is really beautiful to see it uh, alive. This is uh, uh, photos that I received from, uh, from uh, WhatsApp, uh, from the community leader two weeks, um, maybe two weeks ago. This is how the walls are going. You can see the water and dub already with, uh, 
with the first coat of earth. And then this is another weaving that they designed with a, with a wood called Maui. Um, and these are the, now, the, the, this is the, the advance of the community itself. Um, this is how the, the, the uh, wall of the basket is being uh, brought up. We're missing a few things in, in uh, that you can understand with the scaffolding. This is two, three meters, two, three, okay? two, three floor height of a basket. Um, I have this video to show you. I hope it runs. Bueno, les voy a hacer un... uh, this is how the material arrives to the job site. And, uh, and then uh, this is, I hope it's running smoothly. This is actually the, the, the vibe of the Minga, like all the women are, are uh, pelando this, this piragua, which is what they're weaving the nest, the nest with. And uh, it's like a silent coordination, you know? They, they, I, don't, I don't know what time they call everyone, but everyone shows up. <laughs> everyone knows what's happening. Everyone has already their, 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 their positions in the job sites in a complete harmony. Uh, and um, you can see the, the women weaving in the inside and the men weaving in the outside. And these are all the conversations with the materials that they've, they've, they've interacted with since they were uh, uh, kids in the jungle. So they, they, all, uh, they all have a very, um, clear understanding of it and you have nothing to say about it you, you can suggest things but they will tell you no i have to be here you know, this is what my grandmother used to do and this is what i'm going to do and this is what i'm going to do and this is what i'm going to do So you can see the men here are weaving in a different way, in a different wood in the outside and containing the basket. So this is the process that I wanted to show you. And, and, uh, and again, thank you so much for, uh, for, uh, for uh, letting us bring a, a beautiful part of Colombia here. Thank you, Anna. Again, I really, really want to thank you three. Um, it's really an honor to have you. And um, it just, yeah, touches my heart. And I am from Colombia and I know your work. So I, I hope it touched everyone's heart here. Um, I know Andrea's heart has been touched too. Um, but it's, it's been such, a, such an honor to have you here. Um, so thank you. Uh, if it's okay, we, we will move on to um, some questions. Uh, if, um, Anna, if you, if you need to leave, you just... No, don't know. worry, I'm, I'm, I'm on the edge, but I, I'm, I'll stay uh, hopefully until the end. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll just say, we, we, we tried hard to keep it within an hour, and I, I appreciate there are a lot of people that have to leave after an hour, so apologies to us. We, 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 we keep going with Q&A, and I uh, hope you can, if you have to leave, it will be recorded so you can catch up, and we'll try to do better next time, but it's been such a pleasure. So we didn't want to interrupt too much. Over to you again, Catalina. Okay, so if anyone has a pressing question, we have two questions in the chat. So maybe I start with those. Um, so the first question was for you, Juli. Um, it says from Lindsay. Lindsay, I don't know if you would like to turn your microphone on or if it's okay if I read it. Hi. I, I might. Uh, good. <laughs> uh, hi, I already had a reply, but thank you so I just want to say thank you so much for a beautiful um, presentation and would love to learn more about uh, the work that's been happening um, at the Indigenous University, but I've already been sent the link, so maybe I can share it with everybody else. Thank yes, you. exactly. That's the platform. It's called Devenir Universidad, which is the project that's leading Ursula Biman, one of the artists that's being part of the of the process of this uh, becoming of a university. And uh, she is been working on this platform 
that uh, brings all the process together. And uh, it's like the previous part uh, where all the conversations uh, are, are taking place and all the process. So you can check, uh, you can check it through the website. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Juli. Now there's a question for you, Ana. Uh, Maria, uh, would you like to read your question? Shall I read for you? Feel free to turn the microphone on. Oh, yeah, I, I can. Yeah, I can read the questions. <laughs> so hi, Anna. Um, I, I really like the sharing of your the whole process and the project is amazing. And it seems to me like it requires a lot of efforts and time to do it. And I really appreciate it. And so I'm just curious about how long does it take to, um, I mean, how long do, do you expect it to complete the project? And, and, and then is it, is it also as, as you have expected that it takes, uh, the time that it takes is as you expected? And also working with community also requires a lot of communication and trust building. And I see you have been working with lots of them. So I'm curious, what kind of challenges did you encounter when you are interacting or communicating with the with with the community, and do you have any advices for us when you need to work with indigenous people? Well, I'm, I'm, so those are like five questions. Let yeah, me, let sorry. Me... <laughs> no, no, no. Great. The first one, um, time wise, um, uh, the the why I like the project that I showed you so much is because. Um, no one is putting us a time frame, and that's that's actually something that that is ideal for community work. So you have uh, from six months to a year to do the first reading of the territory, and then you can go with the rhythms of the territory. So I would say that uh, community work, especially in the middle of the jungle, cannot have time frames if we're realistic. Uh, we have to really, really know understand that that we are being part of something bigger. And this has to be for life in general, and that we have that we will just uh, uh, support those rhythms and work with them. So that's that's one thing. Normally, it doesn't happen. I I learned to start knowing when to say no to projects that have time frames that would not let uh, this coherency and this powerful processes happen. So that's one thing. The other one is that the, the trust can, the trust with the community. Another uh, important thing that I didn't mention is that this process in uh, Mataben is being hosted for 40 years with an NGO called Etnojano. Etnojano has built a family with them. So when, when this is another beautiful scenario that you're invited to a community that already has an amazing uh, relationship with, with, with this NGO, and therefore you arrive to a very comfortable and a lot of trust. Um, so that that is that is um, that is another important thing of of yes, you arrive to communities when you have already either a based NGO working on it that will have a very strong relationship with the community, or you have been there for, for a while. Otherwise, it's, 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 it, 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 it is a, a lot of the challenges come out quickly. Um, I forgot the other questions. <laughs> uh, oh, do you have any advice for us if we want to work with indigenous people? Go to the fields and, 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 and go to the jungle. <laughs> the yeah. classroom is the jungle. The classroom are the people. Uh, you know, and uh, and uh, if if you vibrate with that, is that if that's your love and passion? Um, make that your life and make that your classroom because it's a never-ending classroom. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's really amazing, and yeah, I will take that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. So we have two, three more questions in the chat, and then Senia also has a question. Um, so maybe I will go for the for the ones in the chat first, the ones that came first. Um, so there's one question for another question for you, Anna. Uh, maybe I will I will read it so we, we move a bit faster. That's okay, and we get all questions answered. Um, and Aidan Seneman is asking about the data collection and human into. I mean, he he writes Anna the amount of data collection and human interaction before the project begins is truly admirable, really inspiring project. I wanted to ask you if you were following a specific methodology for the data collection process. Mm. 
This is for me, Kata. Um, process on, on data collection or there's any specific methodology that you have followed for the initial stages of the project in terms of yeah, data. So I guess he's referring more- Data collection? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, sorry, you were, you were cutting on and off. Sorry, uh, sorry, and I'm going to, 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 to go back to the question begin. So it's, it reads, the amount of data collection and human interaction before the project begins is truly admirable. Um, and the question is, if you follow a specific methodology in that data collection process. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I have like two personalities with this data collection and methodology. I have a personality that is trying to structure methodologies all the time and da, 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 da. And lately I've learned that methods are traps because uh, you are arriving to universes that are intangible to your understandings. And we really, this these projects make you humble to humanity and to territories completely. And they make you understand that you really know nothing and that, uh, that these processes are, when it happens, it's magical, but, the, but you're really arriving to an unknown zone. So I would, um, I guess this, 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 this question makes me more uh, do an invitation to, to there's a lot of, 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 uh, of work to do us as, as human interactions more than the more than than try to understand this in data and in and you know this some this is something that ha, that is more of a day to day basis of understanding the conditions of each community. So lately, I'm I'm letting go of methodologies. Lately, I'm I'm more of a of a of a pro of of this uh, being sensible to the abundance in the territory all the time. You know, like that that if if you tell me. What is the objective of us architectures uh, that love the jungle is uh, uh, how can we keep this table showing all the abundance, you know, and work from that. What are the skills? What are the materials? How are the cycles guiding us and having that table full of all this and, and always showing possibilities, always showing possibilities. That's the data. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I don't know, Pedro, if and who you would like to add on that, because I think all your projects, I mean, Pedro and you, also showed, for example, some drawings trying to, um, to some way communicate or represent what was going on. And Huli, because also there's such a, a like a big like group amount of people, like a massive group of people involved in the project. Uh, if you have anything also to say to that question. Sure. Um, in our case, in, in Tiuga, we, we've been uh, yeah, supporting ourselves in, in let's say, um, community data collection in the sense that it's a very contested site. This is a major, this is a site with major economic interests. There's gonna be a, there is an intention of building a deep water port. Um, the, it's also roots of narco traffic. I mean, there's a lot of contest conditions happening um, and there's a lot of fascinating community-based uh, governance, uh, yeah, situations that have been happening for the last, I don't know, a hundred years, maybe more. Um, but politically wise, from 1993 on, uh, black communities have been granted uh, collective land rights for this land. So there's a lot of hectares that have to be governed uh, community-wise or collectively. And uh, there's also a menace of Ecuadorian and Colombian and Japanese fisheries that are entering this uh, this gulf uh, to fish sardines, to fish uh, tuna, and to fish shrimp. So the, about two years ago, the site was declared as a, as a DRMY, DRMI, which is a um, Distrito Regional de Manejo Integrado, or Regional Managing Integrated District, um, which expanded the, um, the frontiers of traditional fisheries. Uh, moving away the industrial boats. So this is a way of, of also um, creating governance and collecting data around the fish that are present. So there's uh, bio indicators at different levels. 
um, that then are positioned uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture as a way of, yeah, let's say advancing or sustaining these uh, traditional fishing techniques as, as ways of doing, yeah, territorial politics. Thank you, Pedro. Um, Julio, would you like to add that something, or shall I continue? Uh, well, yes, about the, the indigenous university process right now, what I told you before is uh, it's mainly the, the Devenir platform is a really a powerful tool we're using right now to collect all the information that the process is, is, is taking into form. And uh, this is uh, part of the, of the work that Ursula Biman, a, Swe a Swiss artist, is like her, her, her uh, support to the project and to have like the Swiss uh, thinking and order and structure uh, way of, of doing things. It is a very powerful and, and uh, it's very important for the process. Thank you, Juli. Um, if it's okay with everyone, there's some questions from some students um, that I would like to ask before um, continuing. So there's one from Jack. Jack, are you, up? Are you there? Hello. Hello. Um, shall I read it out? Shall I read it out? I was just, I had a question for Juliana, but also partly for Anna in terms of the, the it's really interesting this process of kind of interpreting or translating indigenous cosmology into spatial terms. And I think that, that how that plays out kind of in terms of traditional technologies and individual building technologies. It'd be kind of interesting to know how that translates in the context of the university over these larger scales, the, the territorial and the kind of municipal scales of architectural thinking, how, yeah, like indigenous cosmology kind of influences that level of intervention. Um, I, I hope I heard you well. But, um, um, up, about the relationship between cosmo cosmogony and, and architectural shapes, I think that's our greatest void in our culture. You know, we we are um, uh, we're building aleatoriamente. You know, we don't uh, have a uh, if you if you if you see uh, um, ancestral uh, cultures, their governmental buildings, their uh, communal houses, they're all aligned and um, built responding to many things, the sun, the moon, the, the four directions, the cycles of life, you know, they all represent something. And that's the big void that we have in our cultures. You know, we, 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 uh, we've built um, cities and empire and empires or, or our new modern empires without um, any cosmovision being represented in our houses. And, uh, uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's exactly the lack of, 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 of architecture and form and relationship with form and environment in infrastructures that we're lacking of, and therefore the lack of connection with the territory, and therefore the lack of care for the territory, and therefore the ambiguous interactions of us as communities. Thank you, Anna and Jack. And I think I, I would maybe follow up with another question from another student that Joey uh, paste it in the chat. If you're around, <laughs> you can turn your microphone on. In the meanwhile, I, I will read it. Uh, and I think it touches upon what you were just uh, talking about, Anna. So it says, architects focus so much on build form. How do you think us as spatial practitioners can have a positive influence through a spatial intervention that is focused on landscape or environment? For example, some of us are thinking of not built structures. Therefore, how would you consider the deep analysis of a site in an architectural proposition? I don't know if the one, the, the student who's here would like to turn the microphone on and maybe clarify. Uh, Leo, Hi. go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just realized that you were reading my question. Um, yeah, I think uh, what I meant it was, um, for example, in the Pedro's project, um, how the, the drawings become propositional um, 
by representing um, what is happening in that specific space and um, and how that can can be also under can other not can other architects but like architects as we are trained as can understand that as architecture you know what i mean i don't know maybe i i've confused <laughs> more the question maybe I'll, I'll quickly just react to that that i that idea of let's say using architectural language or right the drawing uh, technology to perhaps draw um these things i, I mean i think that uh, what what i believe is is interesting and jumping back to per, perhaps anna and juliana's uh, project is that there's a recognition maybe that architectural drawing is not only limited to time to to space but it also works through the representation of time and perhaps that's something that also landscape architecture as as practice provides you know a, a reading of designing in time so so i don't know i'm making this connection um just by let's say hanging out and being in those in those moments in those like long days of, of work um that there are limits to architectural drawing, but at the same time, it maybe provides, um, yeah, a different understanding that architecture cannot be limited to space only, but uh, it is also, you know, matter of time. So, so yeah, I think that thinking a, a mangrove tree uh, in the ocean is an architectural practice, um, and that uh, it it must be drawn. And I think that if maybe there are not enough precedents of that once we go to precedent we go to architecture magazines and everything it's only about perhaps the design in space and not necessarily on the design in time so and i think that at the end form is um, is crucial there there's a beautiful question about form in time thank you Pedro. So we already like five minutes to three. <laughs> um, Andrea, shall we, what do you think? One more question, shall we come? Yeah, let's have another question. I'm just conscious of time and um, I think it's good to, to draw too close at three. I know people have to be elsewhere. It's a really nice conversation, but I would also invite, uh, we've always prompted students to ask questions, but it's not purely a space for students. So if others want to jump in, you're most welcome. Josephine, would you like to um, add a semi as well? Oh, I'm sorry, we won't be able to um, to go through all the questions. Um, Maybe Senia. Um. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to thank you, congratulate you. Thank you, Catalina and Andreas, for putting this together. And incredible presentations by Anna Maria. Um, by uh, Juliana and Pedro. Um, Catalina and I met a couple of times a very long time ago. I've been collaborating with something called the Global Free Unit, which follows absolutely the values and the practices of which he's speaking. And I have lived in several forests, uh, so I'm completely a subscriber to this idea that if you want to understand that magic of community design, you have to go to the forest. Um, but equally, for the last two years, we've been developing this project of a kind of different type of data visualization and a different type of analysis visualization, which can it, might it incorporate um, cosmologies and translate them into a Western and Eurocentric uh, visual and verbal language. And we don't know if that's even possible, but it's definitely worth trying to incorporate these, the ideas that you've been speaking about in pedagogies. And we've been working in, um, I lived in a national park in Russia and lived with a the community there in an art park, uh, using collective craft and collective artistic practices e equally like this. And my question is, um, is it important to draw links between 
different practices and cultures, different forests in particular, I'm interested in um, forest urbanisms and river cultures. And do you think it's important for young people in particular and for pedagogies to incorporate those links so that we see the relevance to contemporary societies planetarily and to cities as well? Who are you asking? Or who do you want an answer from? <laughs> mm. Yeah, anyone, anyone who wants to answer, but really, I guess it was, a, um, yeah, it was just a commendation to bring uh, this conversation together. And I personally would very much love to find out more and possibly collaborate on some of this work. Thank you. Yes. Is this um, a reaction from the panel to the, this? Uh, I mean, Anna, go ahead. Why, why is it needed for us, this knowledge? And how does it travel maybe back to our world? Why is it needed? Um, I believe the way that I see it is, uh, and the way that I feel it, and, and the way that I've seen it um, inhabit territories, it is. Just cut. Oh, Anna, we lost you. At a crucial moment. <laughs> Closing up moment. <laughs> Anna, we, we lost you. If you want to recap, if you can okay, recap. I'll recap. Um, um, so first, why is it why is it so important? It's because it's uh, it's where the, the, the connection uh, with nature is still alive. We've been abruptly taking away from nature as our guide, as our mother, and as our teacher. And uh, where I see this knowledge alive and 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 sacralized, sacralizado y ritualizado, it's in it's in ancestral communities. And uh, I think it's 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 it's. it's for me, where the truth of, of, of the essence of, of knowledge lies. So that's why I think it's, it's super important to, 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 to find it for self-evolution and, and therefore for uh, cultural evolution. Um, I, I do believe the web of interconnection between rivers and jungles and different jungle communities has to be um, uh, visualized as well because it, the, the similarities between different jungles communities are, are incredible like like we see similarities and cultures all over the world and, and, and antique cultures all over the world the world and um and i do believe that uh, the 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 we're not preaching to go to live in the jungle naked and that we should all step back to ancestrality there is a need for a new language. There is a need for innovation in product design, in architecture, with technology, you know, but with technology as the as, as a tool for nature to speak, with technology as a tool for the myth of origins to stay alive, with technology as a tool for interconnection and for propagation of, of the dialogues with the no human, you know, with this is. We need, we need technology to help us connect to what we're not connecting or haven't connected. And, and, and therefore we need uh, uh, this, this Western world, you know, what, what we have, what, where we grew up, you know, uh, uh, because these, these uh, knowledges will need this need new languages to, to be able to be explained to us and translated and therefore survived. So, um, but first, I think we need to work strongly in understanding the myths of origin, in honoring the myths of origin, in honoring the processes, the cycles of nature to therefore innovate and, 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 and power technology towards that. Great, I think maybe, maybe on this note, we, we draw to a close, is that a good idea? Sorry for all the questions that we, um didn't have the time to reply. We are aware that's a very short time. Um, each of these contributions could have been like an hour contribution. Um, so yeah, we hope we can keep the conversation going. There is a forest talk padlet where we can upload, we, we, the, this recording would be uploaded. Um, and do please send, keep us sending us questions by email.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Colombia. It's been such a treat to be part of your world for an hour and a half. Really, really appreciate it. So thank you. And also Catalina, thank you for hosting and also for sharing uh, again. And um, uh, I don't know, uh, we haven't really acknowledged Joy big enough. Joy is our wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful master mastermind behind the scene. Joy, wave at us, who's been in communication and uploading things and organizing so and researching. So Joy, thank you so much for all your hard work. And um, and we're gonna start the radio now. I would say uh, is Cameron still here? Gemma, yeah. 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 And Gemma, so if you put up the slide and the radio, and Cameron's in the audience. I don't know if you wanted to say anything, but I thank you all for coming. And uh, please keep the questions and the conversation going. Uh, you can reach us via the website. And we are happy to cross connect as well. So uh, yeah, we are meeting again in two weeks time and uh, very lovely to see you. I leave you with uh, some wonderful sounds from the forest via Camo and Gray. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Anna, Juli, Pedro. It's just, it's been a treat. So it's a hard thing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, <laughs> bye -bye. Thank you so much. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the second episode of Listening to the Forest with me, Cameron. I'm going to be with you for the next half hour or so, playing some field recordings, playing some music and playing some really quite nice contributions that we've had this week. But first, a short introduction. So often, when you live like I do in a big city, it's really easy to feel that forests are kind of behind the scenes, you know, they're places far away that we're disconnected from. But as today's guests and the Forest School programme makes very clear, we must recognise our interdependence with forests. They're abundant with creativity, imagination, ingenuity, and we're connected with them, or we're connected with each other, in both immediate and really, really complex ways. One of the ways, which is kind of particularly close to my heart, in which our connection to the forest becomes really apparent, is in music. On an immediate level, the forests are full of musicians, as our first guest, the musician Ren, known as the Uirapuru in Brazil, will attest to. Shabaka Hutchings, our second guest, one of my favourite musicians, uh, he's an incredible saxophone player who's been practising something called the shakuhachi, which is a bamboo flute from Japan. He talks about his reflections on his connection with this instrument that's made from a tree, but also with the nature around him. Brian D'Souza is our third guest. He's a DJ and producer from Glasgow in Scotland, known as Auntie Flo, who's been working on this amazing project all about ambient music, field recordings, sounds of nature, and their capacity to heal us. Finally, our very own and incredible, my new favourite person, uh, Catalina Mejia Moreno, is going to introduce us to the world of Cantaoras, women singers from Colombia who transmit oral histories, who offer lessons from nature and who sing songs of resistance. So really powerful stuff. We're going to hear some music from Cantaoras, but also from some of today's guests. Also music made within the forest, music made with instruments made from the forest or made about the forest. So I'm going to leave you to it. I'll see you on the other side. Enjoy. O Irapuru habita o chamado subbosque da floresta, a mata mais baixa. Vive caçando insetos nas áreas sombreadas e úmidas. Reproduzimos a gravação do canto. Uma pausa à espera da resposta. Para nossa surpresa, na terceira tentativa... Mas de que ponto da floresta vem o canto? Continuamos reproduzindo a gravação e o passarinho que guarda território 
surge do nada procurando o suposto invasor. Ele é rápido, não para de cantar e procura se esconder. Insistimos e em poucos minutos ficamos frente a frente com uma das mais populares lendas da Amazônia. Seresteiro cantador do meu sertão Seresteiro cantador do meu sertão through the shakuhachi is just by listening in that a lot of the micro adjustments that you need to do to be able to get different sounds and different like atmospheres on the instruments are so small that you can't consciously like do them it just comes from being really still generating the energy within yourself and then listening to the resonance in the space and if that space is outside of nature it means listening to the nature that surrounds you listening to you know what the trees are doing how the sound of the shakuhachi you know interacts with that um, and i found that on this kind of very kind of subtle level being able to listen to nature and then hear how the sound responds to myself being within it, you know, with the instrument. And that just calls for me to just have a greater awareness of, you know, the natural environment that I'm in. With, with the instrument I play regularly, the saxophone, it's more about me applying pressure and, you know, forcing a sound out, and that sound, you know, comes with, you know, dynamic, you know, loud dynamic. With the shakuhachi, it's more about how how much the, the actual piece of bamboo can resonate and how, you know, how that resonance travels. So it's a very different atmosphere in terms of how I'm practicing when I practice inside, you know, the confines of a small room, as opposed to outside in, in a natural environment, um, in terms of how the instrument sounds and what I do within my body to affect, you know, or to mould that sound. So yeah, it just calls me to be outside a lot more um, throughout, you know, all the seasons and it, you know it's um it's made me have a greater awareness of the seasons actually sitting outside in the cold and the you know and the and the hot as the year progresses and the seeing how my body has to adapt
getting out into nature and getting out into forests is, is, is a good thing for our health. And certainly through the whole lockdown period and the pandemic in general, you know, for me, escaping into nature, I'm lucky, in, although I live in London, a um, very busy city, you know, I'm, I'm next to a very big park and basically made it my routine to go down to the, the park every morning and kind of immerse myself in, in the forest. I found a spot where I could kind of be isolated from, from everyone um, off the sort of path you know, right in the canopy, in the depths of, of this of this forest. And um, it became this kind of safe space for me to escape there, um, escape away from all the stresses and strains and um, turmoil that was going on in the rest of the planet and um, have this kind of place in this busy, you know, inner city kind of world where, you know, I could escape. And from that, you know, obviously my interest is in sound, and I started to to pay more attention to to the sounds, the sounds not only on a on a day to day, but but from month to month and throughout the different changing seasons. And that is something that became a lot more kind of like clear to me, um, with the pandemic sort of um, going on in the as as the backdrop. And um, I turned this kind of interest um, in listening to nature and combined that with um, um, uh, you know further forays into music and psychology and consciousness, which uh, led me to studying as a sound therapist. Um, so I was learning how to uh, affect a listener and uh, when it comes to well-being and health in a positive way, you know, kind of really dig in deep into their subconscious and their conscious and, um, and, and, and explore what kind of comes out. And sound is a perfect medium to be able to get people into that meditative state to do that. Sound, from a sort of therapeutic perspective, in combination with nature is where I found there to be a really nice um, synergy that, that, that goes on. And um, ever since I discovered that point, I've, I've been experimenting with different ways in which I can present that to, um, to a wider audience. One of which was our Ambient Flow radio projects, which, um, which we launched and over a year ago and that combines two radio streams in essence running 24 hours a day one that, that contains basically ambient music um hand-picked uh curated um, by myself and guest curators and then the other channel which you can overlay which is a, a the field recordings of bird song and other kind of um nature sounds that um you can kind of weave at whatever volume over on top of the music um and that sort of creates this kind of natural kind of environment where you can listen to the sound and and use the music to to escape to relax to find clarity and to focus and, and and whatever you're doing throughout the day um uh, more recently i've launched the sniffers forest installation and the idea was to kind of recreate a kind of forest bathing experience um in an inner city um a full sensory installation that is a combination of biophilic sound nature sound recordings um music composition that brought in sound therapy techniques such as entrainment, such as this kind of full frequency or harmonic spectrum, you know, such as using different intervals to kind of trigger different emotions, etc. And, um, you know, the intention was you listen, sit back, close your eyes and immerse yourself in 15 minutes um, where you could escape to a forest within your mind. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, people that have I've, I've discovered it, I've, I've enjoyed the experience. Um, you know, I've got a lot of, of, of interesting conversations going around, you know, music being this kind of tool that is a gateway to different realms of consciousness. Um, I think it's something that we, we, we kind of take for granted a lot of the time, and that's something that I'm really exploring as much time as possible at the moment.
sing, pray, mujeres que al cantar oran, or women that through their singing adore, mujeres que al cantar adoran, are women that create and sing their own songs, individually and collectively, narrating oral ancestral histories or everyday stories. Cantadoras are Afro-descendant women from the African diaspora that arrived in Colombia starting in the 16th century, uh, now living in the Pacific and Caribbean regions and coasts, now two of the most affected regions by the ongoing violence in our country. They are women that learn to sing as part of their cultural tradition. Maternity, community life, wakes are some of their usual themes. Singing during wakes, for instance, shows how their perception of death is assumed in a different way less funeral and more inclined towards a festive event. Cantadoras say goodbye to the living souls through songs known as alabaos, an evidence of the importance of rituals and singing in these ceremonies. Beyond being a cultural manifestation, the cantadoras also use their singing to express the different conflicts and problematics that they face every day. Situations such as the armed conflict, the shortage of essential resources such as water, illegal mining, poor governmental administrations are also themes that have prompted cantadoras to create not only songs of complaint, but also communal strategies to express their disagreement and discontent in the face of all these injustices. I'd now like to invite you to listen to the beautiful music of women such as Cantadoras del Pacifico, Petrona Martinez, Martina Camargo, Seferina Banquez, Lina Babilonia, and Eulalia Torres, amongst many, many others. The voices are a tool of cultural heritage, but also resistance and social compromise. So we've just been listening to the incredible Elena Ninestrosa, a wonderful cantaora from Colombia. And we've got one more for you before I head off from another cantaora called Totola Momposina. Hope you've enjoyed this uh, second episode of Listening to the Forest, all about music today. It's really nice to be uh, kind of following on from these amazing talks we've had the last couple of times, so I'm very grateful to be here. 
If you enjoyed this show, please do tune in again next time. We're going to be talking about timber making and agriculture. You'll also be able to listen to all of the episodes as one piece as part of a two-hour special on Radio Al Hara, where I host a monthly show, uh, probably right towards the end of March. I'll keep you posted on that one. So that's more or less it. Thank you so much for tuning in. See you next time. Va subiendo la corriente con chinchorro y atarraya.